Hello, ski racing fans, and welcome to the American Downhiller podcast presented by SkiRacing.com. This is season two, episode seven. I'm two-time Olympian Doug Lewis, and with me is Val Desaire winner, AJ Kitt, Honencom winner, Darren Rawls, and Chamonix winner, Marco Sullivan. On today's episode, we will talk about the strife, Kitzbühel's legendary Honencom downhill. However, I think today our guest outshines our downhill as today our guest is the male downhiller of all downhillers he has 25 world cup downhill victories the most ever by six wins those include victories at the classics vengen garmisch val d'azere val gardena aspen saint moritz and kitzbühel yes kitzbühel four times he also won gold and silver at the world championships in downhill and he changed his life and ski racing's future by skiing to Olympic gold with the craziest of crazy runs in front of the world in 1976 in Innsbruck. Ladies and gentlemen, the Kaiser, Franz Klammer. Yeah, Franz. Welcome, Franz. Thank Welcome, you for Franz. some introduction. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Where are you? And did you get to ski today? No, I didn't get to ski. I'm in Carinthia, at uh, my hometown where I'm born, and I'm looking outside the window, and uh, we're supposed to get a little snow, but uh, it's not looking like, but uh, so we are really suffering this year, uh, lack of snow. Well, all uh, Darren, AJ, and Marco will send snow your way. We have so much to talk about, but we want to talk about Kitzbühel first. I saw the strife on TV as a 14-year-old at GMVS, and it scared me to death. I swore, like I pinky swore with my buddy that I would never run it. Franz, do you remember seeing or hearing about the Hanenkam? What age and what were your thoughts of that race as a young ski racer? When I was a junior racing and, and uh, traveling through Kitzbühel, I was looking up to the Hanenkam. I said, well, one time I really want to go down uh, this, this run. So it's so famous and uh, it's supposed to be the, the wildest downhill of all. So, but then finally I was up in the starting gate. I said, no way, I will not do it. <laughs> These guys are, I was in my pants, uh, <laughs> literally. So I was doing well in, in Valgadena. I was fifth in Valgadena already. And um, so, and then I stand there, I said, well, I'm not doing it. But then all other racers are uh, skiing down. I said, well, if they can do it, I will do it too. So, and then I, I went down and I thought, oh, it's actually not that bad. And it became immediately my, uh, let's say my, my uh, best downhill or the downhill I, I liked most. Franz, when you were young, what, what, you know, as you were, like you said, driving through town, looking up at the strife and, and, and knowing how famous it is, what were the stories back then in the, in the late sixties, early seventies that made you feel like it was such a legendary downhill? Like who, who were, who were the stories about and what were the stories? Uh, my mentor. So he was a, a, a skier from Carinthia. He made the Austrian team and he won even a uh, Meshev once. And he in Kitzbühel, his first time in Kitzbühel. So he never, they had many, many training runs. It was not so, so well organized like today. So, and he always crashed in the exit of the Steilhang. The only one time he finished the race, he was 11th. Uh, so he came down, but he always crashed at the style hug. So <laughs> I got a long story about this craziness uh, uh, about the hunting camp. And I was really looking forward to see it. But then I saw it and I said, well, that's uh, really true. It's, it's, I think it's, it's such a, a, a challenge. And, and it is just so you have to go for it and, and no, no hesitation. That's the most important thing. Did you ever talk to him about what it was like and try and get a few just, uh, you know, feelings from it, some tips maybe? Yeah, so he got me, he got me a lot, uh, many, many tips, uh, just how to become a downhiller. And the most important tip was how to survive the Austrian ski team. <laughs> as a career. So I'm a, from a province of Austria. We are not uh, known as, as the, the, the skier. So it's Tyrol, Salzburg. And so we had a hard time to make the Austrian ski team. And, and so he gave me a lot of tips and uh, especially how to do downhill, how, how to prepare yourself for the downhill and especially kids. So you have to concentrate even more and, and really attack the course, not hesitating. So that's, that's what I really got from him. 
as you all know, as you all know, it's it's just it's it's uh, you're in the starting gate, and now you you know it's the real thing. So you really have to go for it. So that's 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 what I really learned. Especially it's um, in every downhill the same. And how did you kind of like, you know get to that status where you're on the team? So I was on the team, and then he said, "Well, a technical, I have to be ahead of my ski, in front of my skis." And so they had a little tweaky technique at the time. So sitting on the on the in the back seat, and so that's not a not real good thing for the downhill. And <clears> I had real problems because I said, well, never argue with the trainer. So that's his say. <laughs> they say, well, I will do it, <laughs> and you do your own thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so up there, the trainer was standing, said, Franz, you're a fool. Uh, you have to, to ski like this. And they said, well, I will try. And then I was skiing my old uh, stuff. And finally, uh, we had the uh, time tries and I was beating everybody by two and three seconds. So then I was on the team <laughs> to every race. So we were about 14 downhillers and only 10 could qualify. And now they, they, they don't even get 10, 10 races anymore. So some something is lacking in the Austrian team. So Franz, when I arrived, I had Phil Mayer uh, and he took me down my first inspection every mm -hmm. single gate and every single it was so important for me to have that franz who was that person to you and then aj and marco and darren who was that maybe that teammate or a person that that welcomed you to the to the downhill start with franz yeah i i had uh, david thrilling so he was uh, at the time the senior and uh, kyle cordin so these two senior guys uh, on the Austrian team, they have uh, they ran the, the downhill many, many times and they just introduced me to the uh, special sections and, and told me what to do here, to do there. But uh, then I've, as you probably all did, you figure out uh, everything on your own. So that's what you have to figure out. Yeah, I think for me, um, it was probably Darren. Like uh, my first years in Kitzbühel were 2000, two i guess 2003 and uh yeah that was darren had good history there already and was always trying to win that course and i i probably my first time down i was probably looking at him from afar and uh seeing where he was pointing at and then like fran said after you get, go down a couple times you're you've got it just ingrained in your in your mind and you just go for broke and do your own thing yeah, when we went, I mean, when my team went, I mean, we, we were famously uh, had zero leadership. I mean, Bill Johnson was, you know, still around racing, but he he was kind of faded out. He was uh, injured and he wasn't racing. And, you know, we had several years when I was first on the team where Kitzbühel didn't have the snow and we didn't race there. So I'd spent several years on the World Cup before I got to race in Kitzbühel. And so the only thing we could do was watch it on video. We watched, you know, video from the previous years. Uh, you know, the TV recordings and stuff. And that, that was how we learned the, the course, which, you know, as, as people may remember, the stories of a couple of my teammates, you know, going out of the start and going off the mouse volley and jumping over the fences because the video on TV didn't give us the exact line off the jump. But yeah, uh, yeah, like, like you guys said, I mean, after that first run, you're so focused on every grain of snow on the hill and every bump, every little piece of micro terrain. Um, you never forget it. You know, you're, you, you learn it really quickly and you learn where, where you need to, uh, where you need to focus and work on your speed and where you can let them run. Yeah. Mouse and is critical to have the, the, the right uh, direction. So once you take off, it's, it's too late. It's, it's at every jump, but, uh, uh, particularly, um, kids taking the compression and, 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 and speeding up there. Kind of how Marco used me. I used AJ, Ras and Tommy, but. AJ really stood out as the one that brought me under his wing a little bit and gave me a lot of like tips and downhill, um, calculated, take calculated risk, know where to push, where to kind of like be smart. But, um, it really helps, you know, to like pass that on. And I was never like forthcoming with all my information, but I was really willing to, to talk about it. If somebody came up to me, um, Goldie just reached out to me this a uh, couple of days ago about Vengen. So, I gave him some like just a little run through of tactics I kind of like focused on and, and where to trim the line and and uh, hopefully that helps. Franz, do you still inspect the course every year and how much do you think it's changed since you were racing? I mean, are the gates pretty much in the same places? Uh, no, 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 no. They, it's, it's much turnier. Uh, with this new equipment, they make it turnier and they have so much uh, man-made snow, especially the compression um, after... Um, uh, 
after the, the, the mouse fall, sorry guys, I have to get a, a, a charger. <laughs> sorry guys. It's all right. <laughs> Hey, Doug Lewis here, and I want to talk about the American Downhiller Speed Camp. American Downhiller is the leader in teaching young ski racers how to go fast and have fun. 2023 will mark the sixth annual American Downhiller Speed Skills Camp in Mammoth Mountain. Our speed camp is coached exclusively by current and former World Cup racers and coaches who are passionate about helping the next generation of athletes achieve their dreams. We specifically focus on aerodynamics, jumping technique, speed tactics, and the mental training required to safely navigate Super G and downhill race courses. If you are a ski racer who wants to go fast, check out our website, americandownhiller.com for all specific camp dates. Are y'all charged yeah, yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to do it from the phone, but uh, my computer was, I had to do, I don't know. I think there's the a good thing. quality of a downhiller, just, you know, like Franz, you know, just not always focus on details. You're just keeping it loose and just like going with the flow. And that's why you're probably so fast in, on skis, Franz. You weren't always yeah, yeah, yeah. little details. It's like, whatever, let's just yeah. get it on. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh man. Yeah, it's, it's improvising, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what you have to do, especially in Kitzbühel. So you, you have your, your line in your mind, but then uh, it's, everything is changing after the first turn. So you won it four times, 75, 76, and 77. Uh, and then in 84, as a 30-year-old, 30, 30 31-year-old, which is very old, um, the first one you won by one hundredth of a second. The second one you won by over two seconds. The last one you were old. Do you have a favorite Hun and Com win and why, Franz? Uh, it's the first one because I won Wang and Bessrin a half second the, the week, the previous week. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I was the clear favorite, but uh, uh, and also I had to win uh, and win the fifth downhill uh, consecutive downhill. So to, to, to uh, tie uh, or to, to get even with Jean-Claude Kille and, and Roland Colombe. So, and that was uh, my, my first victory in Kitzbühel. And then in last training or on Saturday, Friday, I crashed on the first training run. And I had the cut uh, above my ski boot. And I couldn't, uh, let's say, I couldn't even warm up in the morning, I couldn't make a turn. And the, but they never get the injections. So I said, well, we just bandage the, 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 the foot and then I will go. And on top, it was okay. But on the bottom, after the, the houseback country, the left hand, so it was on the right foot, I couldn't bear the pain anymore. And I was going all the way down to the fence and I barely made the last gate and I still won it by <laughs> one 100. So that was a very wow. special <laughs> victory. 84 is, is special because I haven't won for seven years and my downhill I liked best. And I said, well, I, I cannot stop racing when I not win Kidsville again. <laughs> and I did it in 84. Yeah, that's, so you talked about th that, that string of five wins, but you went at one point in your career over the course of two seasons, you won like 10 or 11 races in a row, right? Yeah, yeah I, I won, I won all, all races in 75, which I finished. I lost my ski in my chef. So, and all races, I, all other races I won oh in 75. Amazing. That, that's total domination right there. Yeah. 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 But, I had good equipment though. <laughs> but I was, I was well, going still, I mean, so. <laughs> we say also, does it, it's not all about the arrow, it's the Indian. Yeah, it's the yeah, Indian. You got, have to run. Yeah. You got, I mean, no matter how fast your skis are, you got to be able to put them to use. So, yeah. But uh, if, you, if you see a uh, uh, Phil Mayer, so Phil Mayer was, uh, on a very good slalom and shine slalom ski with K2s, but the downhill skis were not uh, the best all the time. So with the right equipment, he could have won uh, downhills as well. So you, you didn't want to give him a pair of your skis or what? <laughs> no, I didn't give him a pair of skis. Uh, Erwin Stricker. So I don't know if you guys remember Erwin Stricker. So, yeah. um, and um, Italian guy. So he stole a ski of mine in, in Bengen. So we always put the, the skis up there for the second run. And uh, um, at, the, at the lift, the drag lift. And when I came up for the second run, my ski was gone. So, and uh, later on, way later, Erwin Stricker confessed that he sent up 
a guy from Grindelwald by train to pick my skis. Then he was on, I don't know, some Italian no-name ski, and he just wanted to know how my ski was built and everything. <laughs> so so he, he didn't try and like mask it, like put some tape on there, paint, and use it for a race. He just wanted to kind of take a look to see. No, maybe he used skis. it for the race too. I, I, I don't know. I don't even know <laughs> if they had something on, on, on the bottom, but uh, so. Uh, so that was a strange thing. So I'm up there wearing my skis. Well, let's talk about the start and what it's like to stand in that start. And I raced when Klammer raced, when it was a wooden shack and it was incredible. Darren, please, and Marco, please tell us about what it's like in this Red Bull house up there. But Franz, we'll start with you. What was it like for you to stand in that starting gate and how did you get your mind ready to uh, go down that first 30 seconds? Uh, for me, it was actually always very easy. I didn't have to concentrate a lot. So I, I walked in and um, always ask the, the trainers or the coaches or the, the physios up there with the radio to turn off the radio because I didn't want to know anything to know what's going on on the downhill. I will see it anyway when I get there. So and then I will do something <laughs> what's needed. So and for me, it was easy. At least 10 seconds before the start, I was even talking to the starter and make, probably making a joke. And then when the beep beep came, I was just switched on the, the, the button and, and, and I was concentrated and then I did the race. You know, it's funny. I saw that in the movie where you where you where where everything got quiet. They did a really nice job of dramatizing, you know, all of that. And I, I was the same. I had, uh, I told my trainer, you know, as soon as I got my skis on and I was three, four guys left in front of me, I didn't want to hear anything. You know, I wanted to be yeah. in my own head. I knew my plan. You know, I didn't want to have any updates. And, you know, for me going in that start house, you know, the, the, the Hanukkah was always so legendary and, and being an American, you see it on television and, and all the things. And then of course we hear all the stories and everything. And I was so impressed with the history that is just that building, right? It's so old and you go inside and, you know, people are carving their names you know, in there, um, you know, to be part of, of the Hanukkah forever. And I always said I wasn't going to carve my name into that building until I won. And so I never got a chance to do it. And then I, for all these years, I didn't I didn't uh, go back for like 20 years after I retired. And then I went back, I don't know, like five or six years ago. And now it's this big Red Bull house. And from the outside, it looks like the building's gone. But actually, you go inside and it's there. Right. They it's just huge. It's it. huge. And, and I was so, yeah. so excited to see that the old building is still there with all that history. Um, I still need mm -hmm. to carve my name in there at some point. So uh, it's, <laughs> it's an amazing, that's an amazing <laughs> atmosphere. Yeah. start atmosphere too. Like every other race, there's people, there's noise and people talking and, you know, servicemen are talking and joking around and athletes are talking and joking around, but at Kitzbühel, it's almost dead silent. Everybody's so nervous and so focused that it's so quiet at the start area. The first 30 seconds are incredible. So you have to be focused on that, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. It's yeah, I think the level of focus is so high. And like you said, everyone's just kind of silently thinking about it. I think for myself, I wasn't as, as calm as you guys made it sound. <laughs> like you know, you, Franz and AJ make it sound pretty easy. And, um, but I always tried to, I'd get in the start and uh, I'd try and skate as hard as I could out of the start just to, get set that tone of of not being scared and being like really attacking and try and get in like three skates before that first gate and then you're, once you're on course all the all the nerves kind of went away but just getting out of that start gate was the hardest thing i'd say on race day it was the easiest the first training run was tough because your first time you know like back in kitspiel i was always really focused on nailing my tactics the timing and not taking too much risk, just trying to ski strong and put a good run down to build some confidence. And then even at sometimes, you know, get to the finish line, like, ah, you know, I could have pushed a little more here or there, there. And that kind of gave me a little more of a step up of just more focus and just kind of more grit to go and tack that, that hill. But by race day, it was, uh, it seemed like kind of the easiest. And you know what I was, I would always say to myself, this could be the best day of my life. Right. I have a chance where no one's in the way. I can go as fast as I want to go. I could go just all in. And, uh, you know, this could be, a, you know, one of those just amazing like runs that would be the best of all time I've, I've ever had. So that's kind of the way I looked at it to, to take that approach. Um, Bronze, I mean, I'm sure you're kind of the same way. And, and when you know you're fast, it's just it's an incredible feeling. 
that you could be one of the contenders. Like there's so many great guys, but if you know you can do your best on that hill, it's going to be really competitive. That's a great yeah. feeling to have there. Yeah, but that, that, as, as you say, that's the, uh, it was always important for me too. From the very first training run, go for it. Do, do a good run. Attack the course. <laughs> never ever, never sit, sit back and just let it go. Just always go and concentrate on every run. So and then you're easy, easy in, I mean, it's never easy because it's uh, in, in the race, but uh, I was pretty much the same. I always like to go for it. And, and that, that's the most important thing in Kitzbühel. Doug Lewis here. If you are a U12, U14, or U16, Elite Team Fitness Camps are for you. This is not your average fitness camp as we teach the vital skills of sports psychology and sports nutrition, along with tough, challenging workouts. You will leave camp with more power, strength, and agility, with a deeper understanding about nutrition, and with the mental skills of confidence, focus, and pushing limits, which will take you to the next level. Over our 30 years, we have coached Olympic champions, World Cup stars, NCAA champions, including US ski teamers, Michaela Schifrin, Lauren Masuga, Alice Merriweather, Jimmy Krupka, Grace Henderson, and Sammy Worthington. And finally, although we push our limits to the edge, we have a ton of fun. We are holding two week-long sessions this July at the Killington Mountain School. Find all the info at EliteTeam.com. Uh, guys, I have a funny, funny story about uh, a training run in Kitzbühel. So Ken Reed, I was going down the Mausefalle landing and I lost one ski. And I said, oh, shit. so I cannot stand this compression down there. So I will sit down and, 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 and run into the hay bills. And then Ken Reed 30 seconds, 30 seconds later come down and sit down and really uh, crashes big and was coming towards me. And then he landed in front of me and over me into the, over the fence into the deep snow. And then I got up and I said, Ken, are you okay? So Ken said, what are you doing here? I said, well, that's my place. I was here first. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. I have a st story uh, as well as for training. And it was probably a, a growing moment for a lot of people. So back when I raced with Franz, you could train 14 people because you could race 10. So we would train and have the last training run as a qualifier. So we had 14 in the lineup one, one day and Bill, jo Bill Johnson went down. Then I went down. So we had two out of the 14 make it. And then we had two crashes. Then I don't know, Andy Lund made it. And then we had two more crashes. At one point we were five people down or three people down and five people had crashed. So eight had gone down and we still had uh, six to go. And those six racers grabbed their skis and just walked to the, walked to the gondola, to the tram, tram back then and went down. And I don't blame really? them for it at all. It was probably the, the best decision they ever made was to walk away from that course. Because as you said, you have to stand in that starting gate and be ready to attack that course more than it's going to attack you. And if you're not ready for that, you're going to get hurt. All right. So we have to describe, Franz, you're really good at describing it. Can you f describe the style hung, which we call the basketball turn, uh, which is the last part of the top 30 seconds that takes you onto the road? What is that like to ski? Um, so in Kitzburg, there, there are three really uh, crucial uh, turns. It's the exit of the style hung and then the, 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 the entrance of the... Of the uh, behind the, the, the seidel arm and the Hausberger, of course, the Traverse. But uh, for me, it was always uh, critical just to, to carry the whole speed. You come down there and always took quite a, a wide line and get on your ski and, the, and ski the hell out of it. Get on your outside ski and just go on your ski and, and then uh, ride this, this little uh, uh, pump and just take all the speed you can. So that's, do you need it very badly for the, the next uh, uh, 40 seconds? Darren, did you always hit that right? Or do you just take what you got when you got there? I hit it right a couple of times for sure, but then you get knocked offline. You just gotta, like Fran said, improvise, you know, stay with it. And number one is just keeping the skis clean and um, trying not to be like, you know, throwing some break anywhere. But to me, I'll add one more spot, which is really important, and it's uh, Larkin shoes. And that left foot off that bank is so critical to take that speed, you know, down that pitch and have enough, like, I guess, you know, uh, speed to carry into Hausberg County. And um, 
there is a little lull after style hung. And my goal was to try and come on the, the flats after style hung with the fastest speed. That was kind of one of the goals I had a target for. So what I needed to do to get that, it was really important. But um, I think just overall, I mean, what makes it so exciting is the first 26 seconds and the last 26 seconds, you know, the start and finish there. And, and uh, you have to like, make sure you have a lot of air in the lungs, kind of rebuild back up for house for Conte. Cause you come off that. I like to take a tight line of compression and just hold on. And, and that's survival mode right there. coming across the traverse, but th that, that hill lit me up, man. I tell you like uh, the rest of us, but it was, it was so exciting to ski. It was, it was number yeah. one on my list. Yeah, for, for me too. But uh, Darren, uh, the 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 shoes, the the right hand and the Lehren shoes. That's, that's so crucial because if if you don't get it, you have no speed uh, to, to what the houseback country. And and this is very is underestimated by many many racers. I think you win the race up. Of course, you have to be the fastest. But in the middle, if you if you miss that, so so you are gonna. Even though if you ski fast on the bottom. That's true. I think one of the best feelings too in that course was actually coming off sidelong when it was big, a big jump, right? Yeah. You land yeah, yeah. in the compression. You got to like switch kind of over that roller and you go into that right footer as you come into Larkin Shoes. And I think that the flow there and just having the air element and like the power you can generate out of that right foot, it, it, that was kind of like my most exciting kind of like fun, mm -hmm. I guess, feeling I had on that, that hill. The other parts were, they're pretty tough. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we, we, we raced a little bit different uh, um, line. So we didn't go over this jump at the, at the sideline. So we, we came uh, on the bottom and uh, very fast with no turn. So it's very difficult to, to get it right. So if, if you go straight towards the turn, it's always difficult to, to hit the, to get the timing right uh, for, the, for the next turn. If you come out of a turn, it's easier to find the, the, the uh, to initiate the turn, in my opinion. Yeah, that old that old section before they made the new one, right? The old section was, and I got I was yeah. fortunate I got to run both of them. And when I was a kid, uh, ski racing in Lake Placid, New York, in the early '80s, uh, Franz, you remember Chip Cochran? Yeah, yeah. Chip Cochran raced a little bit of World Cup, and he was a coach for us one winter uh, in Lake Placid, and he would tell us about that section. You come off the road, you jump, and then you land, and it's like you're in a mogul field. It's so bumpy, and he's like. He used yeah, to take yeah. us up uh, up at, uh, at Whiteface Mountain. And he's like, okay, go straight down this mogul field. And that's what that, that section's like. So we would practice and go, you know, through the moguls as fast <laughs> as we could like this. And then he said, you know, the better, the longer you fly off that jump off the road, the better, because then you don't have as many moguls you have to go over. So now, you know, I, I definitely ran that uh, a few times in, in those days where, yeah, I mean, if you can carry some air and fly further down uh, that section, then there's fewer oh. bumps to go over. So, but I, I always liked that old section. I, I, I feel like that new section just kind of was out of rhythm and, and too slow. Yeah, yeah, it's it's much slower than before. It was really kind of fast, but anyway, it's still tough. Uh, yeah. So, so the course prep in my time was injection for me and Marco and and AJ at the end of his career it was um, water injection, a lot of slipping, maybe some chemicals that really kind of like make it super hard and and um, durable the surface. <laughs> But back in your time, Franz, like in the 70s and early 80s, like it was much rougher, it looked like, and had more variable conditions with snow, huh? And, which probably made it harder yeah. to ski. Uh, way less snow, and then they, they, they let it run it in, and they were foot backing uh, uh, the, the course. And on the first training run, usually it was <laughs> very, very rough, very, because it, you, they couldn't feel all the, 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 the footprints. Uh, uh, and it was tough. And throughout the, 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 the training runs, it gets smoother and smoother. Yeah, I've, I've been there in the summertime and I've been up there with cows all over the, the hill. So there's like, there's holes that are two feet deep just from the cows all summer long yeah. on that hill. So it's yeah. already <laughs> rough, you know? Yeah. Yeah, with little snow. So this, this little bumps, you don't have these little bumps uh, nowadays anymore. So that's, that's, uh, that's the big difference, yeah. Yeah, I think with uh, all the man-made snow, because there was no yeah. man-made snow back then, and your fight just, you know, there's just shoveling snow out of the woods, probably trying to throw it on the, all the exactly. footprints, right, everywhere. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, I think your era of downhill racing was the most exciting time to watch ski racing, because it was just, it was like true downhilling, right? <laughs> just 
surviving. Uh, it, it was, uh, I mean, we, we didn't have netting in the beginning. So we're just uh, um, uh, hay bills, sometimes nothing. But if you grow up with it, with this, so you, you get used to it, you know, it is dangerous. You need a lot of guts. So guys who, who were daring, uh, skate faster and the other guys skate slower. That's uh, the, the simplest step. Charles, did you but have any like major injuries in your career? I had one big injury. I mean, big, yeah, I blew my knee in Lake Louis, a very simple fall. I caught the, the ski and, and it was a soft snow and the binding didn't release. And uh, I was turning around the ski until my knee popped. So that was my only um, major in injury, luckily. And yeah. some concussions, of course. I mean, if you go down, you always have something a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who were your i mean you set the tone so much that run in, in 1976 at, at the olympics set the tone for so many ski racers i can tell you for me for sure i was eight years old i remember watching that on television and i remember saying to myself i want to be that guy i want to do what he does you know we skied around after that i remember we were like pretending we were franz klammer you know we had this thing where we'd have one one leg up and one leg down and go over the jumps because we probably had a, a jump like that in the race and we were doing our climber right uh, as little 10 year old kids um but when you came into the sport uh maybe into the world cup who were your heroes who were the ski racers that you looked up to at the time um of course my first hero was tony Seiler. And, and then Egon Zimmermann, so he won the Olympics uh, 64 in, in Innsbruck and, 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 and Karl Schrand. So he was the leading guy uh, in Austria when, when I started to race. So, and then he retired uh, 72. So, so we were looking up to this, uh, this, these guys, um, absolutely. Did you have a chance to, to race against some of these guys? No, no, no. They, 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 Schranz just finished. So, so he, he, he was disqualified at the Olympics and then he retired. And in this, that year, I, start, I had my first World Cup race in Valgadena in spring. Yeah, I was fortunate yeah. to be able to race against some of my heroes. Uh, unfortunately, you know, you and I were too far apart in age. We didn't overlap, but I raced uh, one year with, with uh, Stenmark was, was there still. And, and then, you know, my heroes were like Zurbriggen um, and, mm -hmm. and guys like that. And so it was, it was nice to be able to cross over with those guys a little bit and, and see that. Yeah, I say, I say, I mean, that the Austrian heroes. So I was uh, watching the, the World Championships uh, 1970 and Bernhard, Bernhard Russi won. And then uh, after the Olympics, so he was Olympic champion in 72. And I was in, in Valgadena at the start with these guys, with Colombo, with Russi and all these medal winners. I was so nervous. I was so nervous to ski with, to be in the same race with these guys. So I, you cannot imagine. <laughs> so, but it was a, a big... That was a thrill. That was I clearly can remember how, how it was when I, I met this this really these top top skiers. Yeah, no, it's great. To, it's great to to stand next to your heroes and, and look at them in a different light. Um, my first yeah. victory in Val d'Isere was on the podium with Leonard Stock, and he was the this was in '91, and he was the eight 1980 Olympic champion. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope this doesn't make you feel old, Franz. But you, of course, I was 12 when you won your medal and you inspired me to be a downhiller and then in 1985 when I won my medal uh a, a bronze they bring up the top six at the world championships and who was fifth place it was Franz Klammer so I was yeah. looking down on my hero <laughs> unbelievable yeah. changed my life so uh thanks for going just a little bit slower than me in I didn't intend to, but uh, you are welcome. <laughs> it inspired me. So um, talk about your teammates. Was it a tight group or, you know, what we hear of the Austrians is everybody's fighting each other. Talk about what your teammates did for you and describe your team when you were uh, uh, on World Cup. No, we, we had a really, really good uh, atmosphere in our team. So because uh, Chris Mann, Balcher and all these guys, we all came together from European Cup or from F FIS races. And uh, there was only Tritcher, Twilling, so these old guys and Cordin. And they really took us. So they, uh, it was easy for us. So they showed us a lot of how to do, especially in training. And so we could train with them. And uh, we had a very, very good atmosphere. So we did 
a lot of many many things besides skiing besides uh, training uh, together and so and it it went almost through all the, the whole career so we we really got along very nicely and um, everybody was happy for for everybody so and then so we had a really really good camaraderie so and that's and some friendship so like Werner is still a very good friend of mine even though so he put on some weight <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, but I think I think this is very important if you have uh, not a good atmosphere in the team and if you have some some quarrels and you know these guys cannot talk to the these guys and so so there are two groups building up so this is very bad so it's it's not not good it is actually it is a, a individual sport but on the other hand as you americans you know exactly because you you are such a long time on the road together so if the atmosphere if if the the the, the how do you call it the the thing it's it's not right so then the performance is also lacking yeah, yeah but we uh as americans our american team it was not just teammates but coaches like we had a really cohesive group that worked mm -hmm. super well together and uh we had all tons of respect for each other so it, it was expanded outside just the athlete you know group mm -hmm. with i mean our service guys and our, our coaches we just we traveled a lot together um, we're always on the road, and I think that's like just having that um, that dynamic of a, a strong team, just uh, focus and just um, you know knowing that everybody's doing their job 100% to have success. I think it goes a long ways. Yeah, I, I, I think you you guys agree with me. So if 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 the the the, the chemic is not right in the team, so the performance is 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 not really uh, top. Hey, Doug Lewis here. If you've ever dreamed of traveling to Vengen or Kitzbühel to watch the classic World Cup downhills, then the ADL Ski Club is for you. Their small group trips are geared for passionate skiers and race fans. They take you to the heart of ski racing's biggest races at the Lauberhorn, Hanenkam, and Night Slalom in Schladming. This year, American downhiller AJ Kidd is leading the group to Kitzbühel, and they have a ton of special access to the races, parties, and athletes that make this World Cup unique among all professional sports. Even though this year's trips are both sold out, now, right now, is the perfect time to get your name on the list for next year's trips. Visit adlskiclub.com. That's adlskiclub.com and reach out to them to secure your spot. Rumor has it that I might even be joining them for one of these trips soon. We always kind of like to hate the Austrians. We all, we liked you, Franz, but you were a team that inspired us. Did you have a team or a group of racers that you always wanted to beat that inspired you that like, we don't like the Swiss or we don't like the whoever? Um, not not really. So I, I got along very nicely with, with Rusi and, and with, with, with everyone. So even though uh, inspecting the course, so we were talking about well, what do you do here? What do you do here? Not only to the Austrian, but also when Bernhard come up or, or even Colomb said, well, what, what do you do here? How, how do you take this turn? So, so we were talking about this, we're exchanging experience and, wow. and so on. So, uh, we didn't have... Uh, any problem. So there are some some racers we didn't like that much, but uh, in general it was okay. <laughs> like like uh, uh, Peter Müller was pretty tough guy, but <laughs> but still okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think if you went up to Müller and asked him what the line was, I don't think he'd really help you out much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <clears throat> what which racers do you like to watch now that really embody like the true downhill spirit? You know, I watch almost every ski race if if I have time. I watch women's races. I watch uh, uh, slaloms. I watch. Did you ever see the the last giant slalom in Adelboden with uh, with uh, um, Odermatt racing? Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. that was amazing. Unbelievable. <laughs> what a spectacular race that was, huh? Or run was. So yeah. that's it. Really inspires me. So I I love watching uh, ski races. Of course, downhill is my favorite, and but also. Every every race because I'm interested uh, and I see how they perform and how how it is. I think it's very difficult nowadays to, to win races, especially in downhill, because um, you don't have parts where you really can gain a lot of time. So it's it's a grinding from top to bottom. It's it's a different type of racing now. 
What do you think it is about Odermatt that makes him so good? I mean, that guy, every day he gets in the starting gate, he can win in pretty much every discipline. And he's so dominant in, in the, you know, sort of GS super G downhill and he's young. I mean, what, what gives him that ability? It's confidence. It's absolutely confidence. He, he knows he can beat everybody. And if you have this in your mind, so you, you look around in the starting gate, if, if you're on top of like I was in 75, and you look around the other guys and say, well, there's nobody here who you can who can beat you. And if you have this mindset, so it's easier to race. So and and of course, he take you have to take risk. You cannot uh, uh, do the like a training run. So you ha really have to go. Let's say if training is 100 percent, I like to say then the race must be 120 percent. Then you, you you're able to win. And uh, he's taking risk and and he's absolutely driving with so much confidence and he's always ahead of his keys so that's the thing that makes the difference i think it's just a matter of time when he starts winning downhills uh, i think it will be sooner than later <laughs> no. for sure for sure i i think we all have that respect but we all had that a little bit of ego as a youngster to not back down and to know we could do it franz do you think that's something you're born with to always push your limits, or did you learn that? I, I think you can learn it to a certain degree, but uh, if you don't have it from the beginning, it's very tough to, to get it like, like uh, these guys have it, like uh, Tomba, uh, Ingemar, or, or now Odermatt, Tony at his time, my, uh, myself in the downhill for, for, you know, in the 70s. So you have to have it and yeah, and you have to like racing. So for me, I was better under pressure than if I had no pressure, I didn't perform well, so. Hey, so Franz, so after a lot of success or a win on the World Cup, you know, we've been talking to uh, Buxi, Marco Buchel, about the Swiss team, how focused they were, especially, I remember von Grunigen, like go right home, like just never see him, just, you know, just uh, would never celebrate, but like, we kind of heard that you weren't the most serious guy about going home and being like really, you know, getting to bed early after a race you won. Like you got out <laughs> there and enjoyed your, your time with your friends and uh, your team. And, and um, what was the biggest party that you had after, after a downhill success? Oh, Mengen was always big at the carousel and then Kitzbühel, of course, at the Londoner. So that's, that's huge. In the old Londoner with Andy Mill and, and, and uh, Carl Anderson. So that was a, a, lot, a lot of fun. But I think you have to, so you, you are un, under tension for such a long time, let's say from Tuesday till Saturday, and then finally you are, you are done with the race. So you, you have to have to let it go and, and just uh, get rid of the tension party and then concentrate for the next race. So, so that was my approach to the, to the whole uh, situation. Yeah, and you're celebrating that you're still alive too after coming down the stride. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> after one hell of a ride, like I, I felt the same way. It's like, it was so special. I wanted to share that. I'd had two big kind of moments for me on tour and it was Beaver Creek at the Coyote and, um, and Kitsville at the Londoner. Yeah, the and Londoner. Then you, then you try and be a little more serious the rest of the season so you don't, because it takes it out of you too, you know, it's a long week. And yeah, yeah. I end up always getting sick, you know, like getting a cold because you're tapped out with energy, but you go all night until six in the morning and you walk home and just take a shower with your clothes on and can try and get some sleep <laughs> while the solemn yeah. guys are, are racing. <laughs> yeah, but the big thing was also doing the slalom. So in the slalom, it was always a little bit shaky. <laughs> Did you race slalom at all? Did you ever do the combines? Oh, come on, I'm world champion in combines. He's a world it's champion it. and... Right. His 26th World Cup was a combined victory at Kitzbühel, right? No, 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 in Wengen. Oh, in Wengen. Wow. At Wengen, yeah. So, I, and the back then combined was the Slalom, Chine Slalom, and Downhill. Oh, wow. And, oh, yeah, those three events. And you were, you were racing before Super G started, and then you raced through the beginning, the introduction of Super G as a new discipline in our sport. What did you think of Super G? It was, in the beginning, I didn't like it. So, it, 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 I was I just skipped. I think they had two super cheese at the time, and uh, I I skied once, and uh, it was very close to the chine slalom. Uh, the chine slalom was much wider in the beginning, 
when I came to the World Cup and then it was getting narrower and narrower and narrower the gates, like uh, Tony was very good in slalom and Stenmark was good in slalom. And so they, they, the trainer always set very narrow courses. And then they introduced the Super G. It's supposed to be a thing between Chine slalom and downhill, but the first Super Gs were like a bigger Chine slalom. So that's why I didn't like it. Let's talk about equipment changes from 1975 beginning of your career to 1985, what was the biggest changes in equipment for you that you had to adapt? Not much. The, the, the side cuts stayed the same. So it's just, uh, they, they just worked on the, on the, on the grind of the, of the, of the base, you know, the grinding and, 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 and the, the waxing change, but the, 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 the side cut and preparing of the skis were exactly the same. So, Later on, in the, in the early 90s, they started to change, uh, like Val d'Isere, for these special downhills, they made special skis they made with, my, with more side cut. But before, we always used the same, same thing. There was not much uh, um, uh, new things in, at, at our time. You, it's funny you mentioned Val d'Isere and, and the, the change in equipment. That happened right. I mean, my career spanned the old equipment to the new equipment. And... I remember the first time I met you, Franz, it was at the 92 Olympics and uh, it was a downhill training day and I was out taking a few extra laps trying to learn how to turn these new skis that they did build just for this race because it was extra turny. Um, and I was standing in the bottom of the tram looking, uh, looking up the mountain at the, the Olympic downhill course that came down right under the tram. I was leaning on my poles looking like this and from behind me I heard this kind of snarky comment in a, in a deep Austrian accent. Ah, Kit, I did not know you could turn like that. And I was turning around to give the, this person an earful about, you know, how uh, they've changed the sport because it's too turny and all that. And it's you. And it was the <laughs> first time we met. And I decided instead of, uh, instead of telling you uh, how I really thought, I just said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're right, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can, <laughs> but uh that was funny, and and I don't know. Um, we think we took a ride up in the tram and and uh, talked about the the downhill course, but that was um, it was a big change in the sport took place throughout throughout those years, not just with the equipment, but then the way they set courses. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's much turn up due to the equipment, due to to, to the uh, main made snow, and due to do the equipment. So they had to change, uh, make it much turnier. So our side cut was was a. Uh, 64 meter radius our skis were on and now they they race on 48 meter radius mm -hmm. and then our um, chine salam ski was 48 meter meter radius so it's I actually measured it back then yeah they measured they measured that so we they still go back and then they see it's a 64 meter radius yeah wow. no wonder i had such a hard time <laughs> <laughs> Was there a venue or a race that you didn't win uh, that you still think about, or or is there something that that you didn't get in your career that you you think about? I hated uh, easy downhills. I always liked tough, strong downhills. So, <laughs> and if it's easy, we skied once in Pralu. It was and and one in Heavenly. That was an uphill. It was not a downhill. <laughs> so on the on the other side, on the I think it was on the Nevada side. A very easy. So and I didn't like that kind of downhill. So I really liked it tough and rough and bumpy and icy. So that was my terrain. Jumping was not not so my thing, but uh, making tough turns that was my thing. Wind produces a sophisticated line of ski and snowboard waxes for use by skiers, riders, racers, and shops. The current WEND snow wax formulations have come from over 50 years of progressive blend reformulation and on-slope and in-lab testing. This has been in conjunction with the feedback of some of the world's top ski and snowboard athletes. Athletes who know real speed, like Kitzbühel champ Darren Rolves and 2019 Birds of Prey GS champion Tommy Ford. WEN no longer sells any products containing fluorocarbon compounds and instead utilizes natural, plant-derived and or biodegradable additives that substantially increase the overall eco-friendliness of the WEND Snow Wax product line. Give WEN to follow on Instagram at WEND Waxworks and purchase your WEND products at WENDPerformance.com. And don't forget to use the code ADH20 for 20% off your purchase.
Yeah, we we, uh, we know there's clamor style flying off jumps. It's like <laughs> in the air. Well, you know, talking about the movie uh, Chasing the Line. Yeah, you know, I was one of your stunt doubles there, trying to reenact some of the uh, the action you put down on that hill in Eagles um, above Innsbruck, Austria. But they kept saying, "Okay, remember, you're going clamor style. You must like get." like out of control and, and fly off the jump like that. And that was kind of a challenge to get in those positions, man. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I can imagine, but uh, the one jump is uh, the one, so, which is in the movie, you did a very, very good job on that. So I could see myself. So <laughs> just flying through the air like this. <laughs> yeah, nice. uh, some, yeah. But going back to that, um, just that thought, that Ray. So I'm wearing a shirt. One minute, 45 seconds, 73 one hundreds. Marco, do you know what this is? Yeah, I know. I know. It's my, my Marco's winning. shaking his head. AJ? <laughs> is that the time? Is yeah, it? that's 145.73, yeah. That's I Palmer's have... winning time that right there from that. That's, uh, Olympic race. Game, that's, nice. that's in my collection. Right there. Olympic downhill win. Oh, really? Wow, guys. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> Talk about this movie, Chasing the Line. You can see it. We'll put some uh, information on this podcast about how you can see it in the next year. But how many movies have been done on you? And what was it like to be involved with this movie, Chasing the Line, Franz? There, there has been one, one movie. I did it with uh, some Polish cameramen. Um, so, and uh, it was a very interesting um, thing. It was sea skiing, uh, uh, skiing scenes with Franz Klammer, but I only skied once. We did only crazy stuff, like swimming in a pool with downhill suit on and uh, all sorts of things in black and white. And then, but, so they came up with the idea to, to make a film about my skiing career. And I, I never was very, very happy with, with the script. And finally, they, I always thought, okay, Innsbruck would be quite a good, good thing. And these uh, guys came up with, with the script, like do it one week in my, my life and that is Innsbruck. And I really liked that, that idea because there was so much going on, on the course and off the course. It's, it's just incredible. Did you really have like seven days of training or seven training runs on that course? Really? seven training runs. I couldn't stand it anymore. It, it was just uh, way too many. And back then, we didn't dare to say, well, I'm not racing this training run. So we had to, you have to go, 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 go. And, and uh, just to be, uh, uh, just to say, I was never happy with the run on the course. I never could find the right line, even though I won the, 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 the pre, pre Olympics. In, in 75, I won the race on the Patrick Hofer. But then in, in the race, I was never satisfied in training with especially this big right-hander before the, the, the last part of the downhill. So, I, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't nail it, I couldn't do it. So and it, it was getting worse and worse by every run. Well, what was the difference maker then for the race run? Uh, the difference maker was, I was coming toward this part uh, sh shortly after in, in intermediate time and, and I said, I have to do something, otherwise I will not win that race. So, and I went all the way up to the fence that close. I was, and then I didn't even inspect up there. So I was always taking a very tight line and, and it didn't work. So what the hell, do something and go up to the fence and boom. And, and the timing was absolutely perfect. And probably it's one of my best turn I ever, ever made. Well, the movie will have us believe that it's because your girlfriend showed up and you got a little love in the night before the Olympic downhill. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, it's it's <laughs> you up, but that's that's a Hollywood style. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That, that, that's that is Klammer style right there too. Yeah. Did you, hey, Franz, did you feel like that? Um, you said you're gonna try something new, but did you feel like that would have been a difference, like with more speed, if you got that close to the fence line? So I made some mistakes on, on the upper part. Sometimes I went too straight. And, and, and as you know, if, if you really want to do it right, and you, you push, you put too much uh, effort in and, and you do something wrong. And I was uh, um, sometimes offline. And then I said, well, and now I have to, to as I said before, to improvise. That was uh, one of my strengths in, in downhill racing. And say, okay, let's, let's do something different and, and see what's, what the outcome is and so but if you do that you have to stick to it you cannot start to hesitate and so no not really so 
make a decision in a split second and then do it. Yeah, and that's that was uh, that was I think the decider of the the downhill. Yeah. I know sometimes you know you're fast or sometimes you think you're slow. What were you feeling during that run and did you think it was enough? A lot upper part I I thought I thought it, it's okay, but it wasn't great. It didn't feel that great, but then it really I really came on on the lower part and and I I felt this coming out this uh, close to this hay bills and and uh, this using every bump and accelerating and that's especially the Johannes Johannes Weg uh, there this jump into the finish line so that was uh, that was a real flow I think that was a very very good part of 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 my of of this downhill or the best parts let's say and then uh, when I was uh, in the finish I wasn't convinced that I won it. But then I looked at the crowd and they went crazy. So that's why, okay, then I lifted up my arms. You know what I love about back in the day too, there was like less security, you know? I mean, there's, the fans can be really close to you. And it looked like you just, I mean, you had your teammates and some other like, you know, uh, competitors that came up to you, but it seemed like you're just, just swarmed by the crowd and, and just, uh, I mean, you're the pride of Austria right there. And, that to me just gave me chills. It gave me chills when I was on the podium in third place um, in Kitzbühel with Herman Meyer coming up, and just like that energy from, you know, his countrymen. It, it was just, I mean, unbelievable. I couldn't imagine what it was like for you. It just, I mean, it would have melted me. Yeah, it's 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 so so much action going on. But if you if you win it, it's it's not it's okay. You let it happen. But everybody wants to have a piece of of you. So, and then they said, Austrian TV said, oh, come on first, let's hear. And then Rusi came up and uh, with such a sincere uh, congratulations. So that was a very, very big moment for me that Rusi just lost the gold medal and he came up to me and uh, I got a big hug from Bernhard. So that really meant uh, a lot to me. But, but as you know, Austria is, uh, is crazy about skiing and still is. And, and then that's uh, it's it's a good feeling uh, to have it, and and to know that everybody is actually part of 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 Austrian ski racing. Well, yeah, you say everybody, but I mean, I think you know it showed it like this in the movie, and I'm sure it was very true. But like the whole country came to a complete stop for that race and sat down and watched your run on television, and I'm sure you know the pride that you gave to your country. And not only that, but then the inspiration that you gave to generations of people like myself and Louis uh, to come in and, and try to uh, emulate what you did. I mean, yeah, I mean, to this day, people ask me, you know, what was your inspiration as a kid? And I'll tell them the run in 76. And that's probably the, the most popular answer uh, for most ski racers that they, they saw, you know, your run and, and they wanted to do what you did. It was uh, it was incredible. It makes me very proud that I could inspire so so many young kids. But uh, if you say so, in Vienna, for instance, the capital of Austria, there was no, there were no cars on the road. The kids had uh, free in school, so they, everybody could watch. I mean, the, the whole country was in front of of the TV, and watching it. You don't think about this when you're on the starting it is, you know. So I was a little bit struggling when Rusi was so fast. I said, well, I cannot beat this guy. And so I was going up and down. But then when I walked into the starting gate and was putting over the, the, the my poles over the, the, the bar, and it sounds cocky, but I said, I knew I was going to win that race. Yeah. We'll win that race. But maybe I will win the race, I think. And that's it's about the mindset, what you have to have. I do want to talk about this week's Kitzbühel race and Austrians and the pressure on the Austrians. You just talked about the positivity and the and you were drawing from the crowd, but is there also a lot of pressure being an Austrian in Kitzbühel and having to win? Of course, it's it's the best downhill in the world. We all agree, I think. <laughs> and then it's in Austria and the Austrian they have to win. So and they, it's they put a Austria puts a, an extra pressure on you. And especially this year, so it was uh, the last year's Matthias Meyer just retired. So we only have actually two downhill races or maybe three at the moment. And this is, this is um, 
uh, not really good for Austria. And the Swiss are very, very strong. Norwegians are very, very strong. So it will be a very tall task for Austrians to do. I think they will do well, but to win the race, as you know, it's, it's always a different story. Franz, you brought up Matthias Meyer, and that was one of the questions I had. Like, I wanted to ask you. I know you're very tight with him. He's from your same area. Area. You yeah. know, he's. Like, I've asked you before who you're, who's your favorite kind of young gun Austrian over the years, and it's been Matthias Meyer. Were you involved in any you know uh, conversation with him leading up to his decision in Bormio, or was that a shock to you as well? No, it was a shock. Uh, I mean, it's a big surprise because he did well in the in the in the races in in Lake Louis and in Beaver Creek and 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 in in Gardena. So I think uh, it was a big big surprise that he he uh, announced his retirement. But it's it's a strange. I did pretty much the same when I retired. I was uh, going. I was stand, getting up in the morning in Aspen, nineteen eighty five. And I didn't know that I will retire that day. I was warming up like normal and, and, and uh, just doing my, my whole routine. And then I was going into the starting corral. And then I looked around and said, well, this is not the right place to be in anymore. So I went down not very well and quit. So it was pretty much the same. <laughs> and I always wanted to, to finish my career like that. So, and I was quite happy, and that's why I can understand uh, his decision very well. All right, we're about to make our picks, but I just wanted to follow along with that. So, Franz, as you know, uh, once an, an athlete makes the first seed, you become part of the ultimate uh, downhiller group. And Aspen 1985 was my first race in the first seed. And on that morning of the first inspection, one by one, the rest of the first seed came up to me and congratulated me about making the first seed. And you were the first racer. I think everybody was waiting for you, but you were the first racer to come up and say, congratulations, Louis, on making the first seed at that Aspen race in 1985. So it was, it still gives me chills that uh, they waited for you, the Kaiser, to start this uh, annual ritual. So it was amazing. The ADL Ski Club is proud to be the exclusive U.S. promoter for the Franz Klammer movie, Chasing the Line. The movie takes you back to 1976 and focuses on the few fateful days that culminated in Klammer's wild and crazy run that secured his victory at the 1976 Olympics and his place in history as the Kaiser of Downhill. The film tour kicks off in Seattle on February 15th, nine days and 47 years after his famous victory. You can find all the tour dates, tickets, and movie swag at ChasingTheLine.com. And if you don't see a show in your hometown, contact them. They're actively looking for local independent promoters to host shows across the country. Franz, do you want to make the picks for the Kitzbühel downhill, who your top three could be? I have to go for Austria, and I go with Griechmeier, um, <laughs> Odermatt, and Kilde. Okay. That is good. All right, AJ, I'm going to put you up next following Franz. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I've put some thought into this, as, as you know, I'd like to do. Um, and I think because of the conditions, which we know are going to be thin snow, which means it's going to be bumpy. And I think, you know, they're going to do everything they can to ice it up. Um, I think the, the most confident skier in the world right now is Odermatt. So I'm going to pick Odermatt to get his first downhill victory, uh, unless he does it in Wengen uh, this weekend. But I think Odermatt's my number one. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm holding out hope for Beat Voigt's because it's going to be his last race. I hope he does something uh, special. He's won that race a number of times. And I think he's, uh, he's got, uh, got what it takes on that hill. So Voigt's is, is, uh, one of my top three. And I, I agree. I think, uh, I think Creekmeyer has been showing a lot of, uh, speed and I think he's a good choice too for top three. All right, Marco. Um, I have not put as much thought in as AJ, I don't think, but. You want to, you want to take a moment? No, I'm, I've got it down. I'm, I'm going to agree with Franz with the Austrian victory. I think uh, Kriegmeier on top and uh, Kilde second and maybe RCS slipping on the podium for third. Nice. D-Money? Uh, I got five guys. <laughs> okay. I guess I'm thinking about 
And uh, oh, AJ's throwing his hands up. Well, you, you can't get you can't pick five. Yeah, do not. In the top <laughs> gonna, yeah. How about I pick You're, 10 guys? I can pick 10 guys. And one guys is gonna win. All right. <laughs> no, okay. I'm gonna go with um, I'm going with the big boss, Kilde, Odermott, and Paris. I think Paris is gonna bring something back. I mean, he just has been lacking, you know, some speed. Formio was a big surprise, and uh, yeah, so I'm putting him on the podium and then the other two my five guys i'd say creek meyer and rcs they're good anything can happen there <laughs> you know i'm gonna go it, off man. i'm gonna go off the reservation a little bit i'm going rcs for the win because oh. he almost won this thing once uh i'm gonna go two i gotta go austrian because of franz i'm gonna go Hemitsberger because i like the way he skis and then yeah. third is gonna be paris because he owns this course so i'm a little bit out there but you can't win if you don't push your limits Oh, yeah, that's right. I just wanted to say it's been an honor talking to you and hearing your your take on the downhill and, you know, the fact that you're still involved and a fan of the sport is really cool after the uh, impressions that you've made on all of us. And just thanks for being here. Yeah, Marco uh, speaks for all of us. And, and you're still a huge inspiration, Franz. And, you know, what I really value a lot is our friendship. Um, yeah, I never knew you racing, but then I met you, you know, in Kitsville and, my first time back after seven years from when I finished racing, I was out pretty late and I was walking back to the hotel and I look in this window and I see this like party happening and look a little closer and it's you in the middle, just dancing around. I come in there, <laughs> like you brought me in, we had a big like moment, a nice hug. You're like, stay here. I'm like, I'm going to bed, you know, <laughs> I'll see you on the mountain tomorrow. But you know, yeah. you really live it up still. And, and um, to me, that's like, that's something special too. You know, it's just, your heart and soul was into those downhill runs, but it was also just living life and um, smiling, laughing all the time. So keep living that way. Thank, thank, thank you, guys. So I think uh, the one important thing, just what what really um, took from skiing, from racing, it's a, it's a friendship with uh, many many racers. So that's the most important thing. So I got met so many people. Whoa. And now we are friends, and I think this is also important. It's not only competing against each other, but also sharing a lot of things together. I think that's uh, very, very important. Thanks, Franz. Those are words to live by. Thanks for listening and watching to our American Downhiller podcast. Special thanks to the Kaiser, Franz Klammer, for joining us, the world's greatest male downhill skier who defines yeah. the word downhiller. If you're interested in traveling to Kitzbühel ever, contact our sponsor, adlskiclub.com, and there's a good chance you will get to buy the Kaiser a beer and enjoy it with them while you're in Kitzbühel. Please spread the word about the podcast, share with your friends, coaches, teammates, and club. You can find us either on Spotify or Apple. And thanks to our American downhiller sponsors, ADL Ski Club, Wend Wax, Elite Team Fitness Program, and American Downhiller Camps. For Darren, AJ, Marco and the Kaiser, thanks for listening.